just to give you a few uh, uh, biogra biographical uh, um, <coughs> points. Uh, Professor Cingolani is a physicist and he took his degree in Bari and then uh, also the PhD and uh, he also has a PhD the uh, perfezionamento here at the Scuola Normale Superiore. Then uh, he has been associate professor in physics at the uh, University of Lecce and then full professor. And uh, <clears throat> since uh, 2015 uh, is the scientific director of the Italian Institute of Technology. In 2001, he founded and was the director of uh, uh, the National Institute for the Physics of the Matter. Uh, Professor Cingolani is author of more than 700 papers and 30 patents, mainly in the fields of uh, structural, optical, and electronic properties of uh, nanostructures and uh, semiconductors. Uh, molecular nanotechnologies for plastic photonics, OLED and, and plastic electronics, bionanotechnologies and biomimetic systems. He's a member of various panels uh, uh, <coughs> of the European Commission <coughs> and a uh, member of different panels also of the Ministry of uh, Research and University He's here in Italy. Today he will uh, tell us about uh, translating evolution into technology. So, please. Thank you, Chiara. Um, so it's a big pleasure to be here again. Uh, I'm, I'm heartfelt uh, bound to Scuola Normale because of my, uh, my, my past activity here. I remember, I think I was one of the first experimentalists uh, after Gozzini, uh, building up the lab in Via della Fagiola. So this was a very uh, pioneering time, 1986, 1987. Um, yeah, okay, what I wanna show what I wanna show you today is something which has to do with the recent activity we, we've been developing at uh, at the IIT in Genova. Um, most of this activity, as you, you will see in a bit, uh, cannot be done by a single man, obviously. It, it, it's a very strong system integrated uh, research. So uh, at the very end in the acknowledgement, you will see uh, how many people uh, will be involved. However, there are a few concepts that uh, I'd like to share with you that, that belong intimately to the uh, strategic plan of the Institute. Um, right now, for those who are not aware, uh, IIT is a, is a cluster of, of laboratories uh, country-wise. Well, start with a very good technology. My laser doesn't work. Let's see this one. There is no laser working. <laughs> Okay. Ah, uh, no, this is the TV which is absorbing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's physics. All right. So, <laughs> um, well, the, the, there's a cluster of laboratories countrywide. There are 12, 12 labs, the headquarters in Genova, and there are a couple of more labs in, in, in the Boston area, machine learning in, in MIT and, and the uh, optogenetics uh, in uh, the Harvard Medical School. Uh, right now, we count approximately... Uh, 1,500 people, um, with some proudness, 41% are women, uh, and about one half are coming from abroad. We gather more than, um, we gather scientists from more than 50 countries uh, all over the world. Um, and we also have a, a site here in, uh, in Pisa, a lab in Pisa at the, at the Nest uh, Laboratory. Um, okay, let, let, me go, let me go through the, through the idea I want to share with you. <clears throat> As you very well know, uh, over the last three billion years, nature developed uh, a very complex system starting from few atoms aggregated. Um, okay, we start with the idea of the antibody or any, any complex molecular system. And of course, with increasing complexity, uh, that is number of atoms or number of molecules, uh, the functionality of this system has been increasing in, in, in complexity too. Uh, so you go from the antibody to the virus, the virus to bacteria, and all these systems are operating through uh, biochemical interactions. So in terms of uh, slave machines, what is normally called a robot, these are biochemical robots, uh, and they interact without producing uh, mechanical work. Now, um, during the evolutionary process, uh, some of these uh, materials, some of these objects, um, started to originate cilia, tails, legs, wings, small uh, propulsion systems. So they started to produce work. 
So complexity increases because of the nervous system of muscles, control, and of course producing energy and mechanical energy is a different story than producing biochemical interaction. So in that case, uh, biomechanics enters into the game. So biochemical robots and biomechanical uh, systems. With increasing complexity, uh, of course, you go towards much more complicated systems such as insects, plants that you normally assume to be uh, uh, immobile objects, but they're not. Roots move essentially very fast in a very smart way. Um, and of course, with increasing complexity, you go towards uh, cognition. So essentially, you introduce a brain because you have to control so many functions, uh, including social behavior, um, cognition, and so on and so forth. So basically, you have three domains. Um, biomechanics, uh, biochemistry, biomechanics, and cognition. And basically, this is what nature did in three billion years to reach our standing. Uh, now, what technology is doing over the last 20 years is to reproduce this evolutionary picture into machines. And machines at the moment are, in the nanometer size, uh, artificial antibodies. You can make micro, micro insect, you can make uh, robotic plants or plantoids, you can make animaloids, you can make humanoids. And of course, uh, copying is sometimes more difficult than creating. Uh, this is an old story, as the Japanese has taught everybody. Uh, but this is actually what, what technology is doing now. And what I'm, what I'm going to show you today is how you can go through this evolutionary pathway to show how technology and science, in turn, develops uh, uh, along the evolutionary description. So I will start with the biochemical robots. Please keep in mind this figure, because basically I will go from the artificial antibody down to the humanoid. So I will go step by step through the plantoid, the animaloid, the humanoid, and so on. So let me start with this uh, uh, description of the biochemical robots. This is a complicated puzzle machine. It's very small, below 100 nanometers. Otherwise, the immunitary system would detect and stop it. Uh, it, it's a very complicated machine in terms of uh, robotics, if you wish, uh, as this includes imaging capability, sensing, drug release, and responsivity. This is a system that, that travels into the bloodstream. Uh, it's capable to sense the disease, that is to identify the cell or the molecule, whatever, which has to be tackled, uh, to release an image, so we have to see where is the cell, uh, to release a drug, and eventually to release the drug according to um, a specific response to pH variation, to temperature variation whatsoever. So it has to be a responsive intelligent machine uh, capable to release a, a payload, a drug or whatever, uh, giving an information where this is released, and of course sensing this at very early stage. Now, there are <clears throat> uh, hundreds of solutions being, being uh, under uh, investigation at the moment, liposomes, uh, all kind of polymer constructs, and so on and so forth. What we decided to pursue as a strategy is a very unique strategy, uh, relies on super paramagnetic nanoparticles, which are clusters of approximately um, 20,000 atoms, diameter in the range of 10 nanometers, tetrahedrally coordinated. Um, These super paramagnetic particles essentially expose a lot of oxygen surfaces, which can be easily functionalized uh, in a way that you can grasp responsive polymers around. The responsive polymers is capable to uh, uptake and release uh, according to specific stimuli um, any kind of drug, even, even multi, multi drug combinatory therapies, so anti inflammatories plus uh, chemotherapies and so on. And at the outer shell, at the outer surface, you can grasp covalently uh, molecules which are capable to recognize the receptor of the disease and eventually fluorophores and everything needed for imaging and detection. As a matter of fact, this kind of cluster is approximately 120 nanometers in diameter overall, and it can load up to 95% in weight uh, drugs. So normally they have a magnetic responsivity which is superior to the endorem. The endorem is the typical NMR contrast medium that you find on, on the market. These are the best performances in the transversal magnetic resistance. Um, they, they are quite interesting. You see, this is in a UV lamp. The, the particles are in water solution because these are water soluble. Uh, they move, they fluoresce, of course. They move around the magnet. So they, they, have, they show very convincing collective motion. That means that one by one, they can be conducted either by an external magnetic field or biochemically, and they don't cluster because they have a very specific surface uh, uh, functionalization. This is typically uh, what, what we mean with this technology. Uh, in the presence of an external uh, oscillating field, so radio frequency, the temperature of the super magnetic particles can be increased up to some 50 centigrades. And if you develop by colloidal, 
uh, nanochemistry, colloidal deposition, you can develop particles of very uh, controlled shape. This bar is 20 nanometers. And of course, depending on the number of uh, edge, you have a very high concentration of electrostatic field in an electrodynamic concentration of field so that you can increase the temperature in a very effective way. And this, in this case, you can apply not only smart delivery of the drug, but you can also increase the temperature for hyperthermia, which is an extra characteristic of this uh, smart uh, robotic antibody. Of course, you can play a lot with the shape and with the characteristics. I mean, this is just a, a compilation of shapes. You can make cargo nanoparticles cluster in a polymer shell. You can make quantum cubes. You can make complex nanostructures, each one having specific features in terms of release, transport, and so on. So really, you can do a lot by colloidal chemistry. This is now to show you how it works. Um, this poor animal. Um, it's been treated in a spe special, specially designed hyperthermia system. Um, actually, uh, in this case, we work with 30 milli Tesla uh, frequencies, which are quite, quite standard. Uh, and uh, this specific mouse has been treated with nanocubes, so this uh, quantum cubes I've shown before, uh, by using doxorubicin. Um, just to give you an idea, what happens in terms of uh, Imaging, this is the intratumoral heating where you can detect by special camera the temperature. After 30 minutes, the hyperterm is quite effective. You see at the core you reach something like 40 to 41 centigrade, which is almost enough to, to kill thermally the cells. But what is more important is that the combination of uh, the chemistry and the hyperthermia provides very interesting results. I mean, this, is, this would be the control. This is the normalized tumor volume. This is the control animal. This is only the hyperthermia, uh, 10 days after injection. This is the chemotherapeutics as standard, and this is the combination of chemotherapics and hyperthermia. So it, it's really a powerful tool, and the idea is that you have one cell, one nanoparticle. So it, this is meant to be a very selective scalpel somehow. It's, it's a surgery. It's a, surgery, a surgical intervention in terms of therapy because you can really uh, control the dose without counterindication in terms of massive chemotherapical doses that you normally apply to patients. Okay, I don't have the time to go through all these things. I'll try to give you a compilation, but of course you can, we can discuss in more details later. I want to swap directly from the, from the very small things to the very big things. This is the plantoid. This is something, by the way, developed partly also in, uh, in PISA because the, the PI of this, uh, of this new uh, robot generation is uh, uh, Barbara Mazzolai, who uh, was a scientist that originally started her career in, in, in PISA and then now she moved in Genova. Now, let me, let me show you what is the concept here. Uh, this is, this is the, actually the first plantoid robot in the world. Uh, the, the leaves are... Um, responsive to humidity and they are photovoltaic, so they generate, uh, they generate uh, energy for the intelligence of the robot. This is a root, actually. The root exhibits the basic properties of roots in nature. So gravitropism means that whatever is the inclination of the plant, the roots always points towards the central mass of the earth. This is why plants are stable, independent on whether they are on a, on a hill, or on a flat ground, so they always keep the, the gravity at the center. They are thigmotropic, which basically means that they avoid obstacles. So roots don't like to, to, to grow where there is an obstacle, and they find another way. That's why plants, they always survive. They are hydrotropic, so they go towards the water, because this is the basic food. And they are thermotropic, so they don't like uh, heat sources. So if there is, if there is too much uh, high temperature, they, they just escape. Now, giving this, <clears throat> giving this uh, properties to um, an infinite elongating screw, flexible, by a technology that I'm not, I have no time to tell you. The idea we're trying to develop is the smart endoscope, which you, which you see here. So essentially, it's a technology that at the tip of the root has the same intelligent nanoparticles for the drug delivery that finds automatically the disease and goes there by growing into the body without surgery. So this is, this is called, or supposed to be, the smart endoscope. So this is the long-term target of this research. In the meantime, another smart application that I'm going to show you here, this, of course, this is a cartoon, 
It is that for aerospace application, when a satellite lands on an unknown surface, and this happened on the, on the comet recently, on the Rosetta comet, the, the rover fell, if you remember. Uh, this simple system, this small satellites can elongate their routes, stabilize, get energy from, from light, and in, incidentally making the ground analysis because these routes have the intelligence and the sensing system to make the ground analysis. So for aerospace as well as for agronomy, this is a very smart technology. This is why it's being developed now, but of course the long term is for the smart endoscope. This is how you can copy nature to do something really useful. Now I go to the animaloids. So I'm moving towards the complexity pathway to, towards something very big, 10 to the 27 atoms, so much bigger. <clears throat> and I want to show you, obviously, the, the first thing that, that, that people want to copy is animals. This seems to be a very massive machine, but it can do something that only goats can do. OK, th this is our hydraulic quadruped. It is actually the most versatile quadruped in the world at the moment. It was probably two years ago. Now it is. Uh, it has an intelligence uh, essentially given by the combination of vision and a vestibular system like ours, so uh, horizon, center of mass stabilization, capability of dynamical equilibrium, so that it can change the pathway in any circumstance. So for instance here, we change the, the landscape and he re it reaccommodates immediately the walk. Now, this kind of machine has been developed for a number of applications. Um, definitely disaster recovery. I mean, we live in Genova. We have a flow every couple of years with many people dying. So the, the first order we got was, was from uh, Protezione Civile. Because this, this is really a machine that can go everywhere, where no wheels, no humans can go. Imagine Fukushima. The problem in Fukushima was a trivial problem. People could not enter into the uh, nuclear power station because of the radiation field, the average radiation uh, density. Um, this machine could have been inside very easily. Look at this. This is like a real animal. 30 kilos uh, bumping laterally, and it takes just three lateral steps to recover the equilibrium. So I go back to Fukushima. The point was how to enter in Fukushima, that was a biped under the same uh, experience. So you enter in Fukushima, and then at this point, you just need hands to rotate a valve. Now, the, three, the, the, the trivial thing is that on, on this quadruped, you can easily install an upper body with arms, and, and head and whatever. So you make a Centaurus. I'll show you something later. So it's very easy for a machine like this to enter in Fukushima and then to operate under remote control eventually, even without uh, important intelligence uh, to change uh, the status of the, of the pumps, to rotate the pumps and so on. OK, I want to show you something now that is, to my opinion, biomechanically extremely relevant. This is the last version, the most advanced, the most advanced quadruped you can find at the moment uh, uh, around the world. This is a Jaguar. It's an extremely fast machine. Now it is upside down. It just fell. Okay, imagine the animal was falling, and now look how it will recover the original position. This is exactly what you call colpo di reni, kidney shot. And now it's ready to move, run, rush, attack, whatever. Okay, clearly this machine is not being designed for military application. This is a machine that can bring 75 kilos on the shoulders, it's as big as a, a big dog, and it's meant to run 25 kilometers per hour on any ground, under any condition, completely self-powered. At the moment you see some pipes because this was a, a lab uh, exercise, but now it is completely autonomous. So you just push a button and it goes. And these are, even for mobility, a very, very interesting new devices. I mean, we, we could go, one day we could go back to horses, like the cowboys, but, but, but uh, riding a horse which is fully mechanical and having, having a consumption, energy consumption, which is about one third that of a motorbike because of the advanced, very, very advanced biomechanics. I mean, that's a scenario we don't care so much, but just to give you an, a fantasy idea. Now let me go to something more serious. Um, this is my third kid. I have three children. This is my, my smallest kid. He's six years old. His name is Alkis. And this is, well, I cannot say my fourth kid because it has approximately 400 parents in the lab. It's a very complicated machine. But this, I think you have seen this even in the telecom advertisement recently. It's this little star. Actually, this is the most diffused humanoid platform in the world. There are 34 robots at the moment. And it overcame the, the Asimo from Honda. It overcame um, the Toshiba robots. So he really seems to be an exceptional breakthrough of the Italian community. But I want to tell you 
where we are now and where we go. So Alkis, my son, never stops with 1,500 kilocalories per day. Essentially breaks everything around without stopping, 24 or 24. And he, does a, he has a very low energy consumption. He holds 10 to the 14 synapses. Uh, that's a mistake, not neurons, synapses. He holds a 3D structure for the brain, 75% water, approximately 10,000 interconnections uh, among neurons. For a total power of 40 watts, this is the, the brain consumption, he can perform, like any other human, normal human, 10 to the 18 operations per second. I doubt everybody can do this in, in, some, in some area, but for sure in this room everybody does at least 10 to the 18. <laughs> okay, on the other side, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, we have 10 to the 9 transistors, we have a 2D structure, silicon, like this. Uh, each transistor is interconnected to only the, the nearest neighbors, 10 transistors. And you know by the ohm load that the, 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 the far away you go, the higher is the energy consumption. This does not happen in the brain. And that's why we pay approximately 200 watts to perform only 10 to the 8 operations per second, which is the cost of this computer. All the rest has to be done in a big server with a big supercomputer in remote operation and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, ICAB needs 1,300 watts for two hours operation, in which it does very little compared to my kid that can do by far more with only 1,500 kilocalories. And if you compare kilocalories and watt, you will find this ridiculous amount of power that a human needs to do much more than any robot. Even the best robot in the world does not compare. So that is the challenge. And I will show you where we go with this. So first of all, artificial intelligence matters here. Uh, neurons versus transistors, electrons versus ions, adaption versus interconnections. These are the three things uh, that possibly are unbreakable barriers. Then there are a number of other technologies like uh, learning adaption, speech and audition, grasping and manipulation, biomechanics, I mean, the robot has screws, motors, cables, coils. We have fibers, ion responsive systems, water conductivity versus copper. You know, it's, it's a very different architecture. Actuation is completely different. So what happens today, if you take this very famous Kurzweil plot, this is a little bit science fiction, but I think Kurzweil now is works in Google, so he's not the last guy in the world. And he said, uh, if you see how computer grew up over the years, um, they, I mean, a good computer today performs 10 to the 8 operations per second. And if you want to do more, you need a big cluster, you know. So today you can do exaflop uh, computing, but you need 35 megawatts of power. I think, Vincenzo, you know it because you built up a new computer center, and I'm sure you need kilowatts and kilowatts for that. Now, surprisingly, humans, they do 10 to the 18 operations per second at a very low uh, computational cost. We can do the same synthetically, but we need 35 megawatts. So <laughs> this is a big problem. And, uh, this is a, a supercomputing, this is a top 100 supercomputer map. And you see now we have this uh, uh, Cray XT5, and there is this uh, super whooper computer in China, uh, exaflop machines, but they, they, they just need 30, 35 megawatts of power. So again, this has to do with what I told you before. If you compare the brain of my kids and the brain of, of, of the robot, the, the, those numbers uh, essentially are the basis of this difference. But there is also something much more advanced that we should never forget. This goalkeeper doesn't know anything about physics. He doesn't calculate air friction, he doesn't calculate aerodynamics, he doesn't know anything about initial speed, uh, gravity attraction, spin, he doesn't know anything. He just sees the ball, jumps, and he will touch the, the ball with the hand at the right place at the right moment. He doesn't know why, but he does it. If you want to do the same with a, with a supercomputer, because you need a supercomputer, um, you have to do a variational calculation of the best trajectory, minimize time, uh, space, considering all the boundary conditions and setting the best trajectory to be at the right time with the, with the right hand in the right position. Unfortunately, in, do, in doing this calculation, very likely, the calculation will, will last more than the shot. So by the time the calculation is finished, the ball is in the net. So that, that's the point. And, and the reason is that in our brain, we are so much optimized by evolution that there are clusters of neurons that supervise completely different operations that are very synergistic. For instance, there is a class of neurons that are um, essentially controlling vision and controlling grasping. 
So the same part of the brain helps us in understanding what we see and help us in, in reaching, so controlling the movement. Another part is controlling the, the tongue, so the, the operation of the mouth, the, the speech, and the understanding of the words. So this kind of synergy is impossible to reproduce in a computer at the moment, primarily because of an interconnection problem, primarily because of a computational problem. And this is really, at the, at the time, for the time being, an unreachable challenge in terms of technology. Neuroscientists, they know these things very well. They start having a fantastic description of the brain. And technologists, you know, physicists, engineers like, like me and others, we are very frustrating. The more they understand, the more we see that we cannot reach, we cannot compete with, with, with the, uh, the structure of the brain. So right now, I can tell you that if you take a computer and uh, a mechanical actuator, I don't make a humanoid, I don't make a robot, I just make an industrial actuator. And if I make a humanoid, I'm still far from a human. I mean, this equation will last for at least another 20 years. It has to be very clear. Now, in the end, we will discuss about ethics. You could tell me, okay, what is the point to make a robot? You can make kids, it's easier, it's cheap, it's even more pleasant, so why you need, you need an artificial body? But that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question, but it has a real, a real uh, rationality, this kind of, uh, of science and research. The point is that we want to have machines capable to decide, capable to act in response to specific situations. We don't want emotional machines. This would, would, would be a nonsense. There is no hormones in these machines. But we want smart machines to replace people in a dangerous environment, to replace people in harsh environment, to help people at the workplace, in the house, when they're old, especially in a society that in the next 30 years will have one active person per retired person. I hope this is clear to everybody. In the G20, in the next 20 years, we will go to one-to-one -one ratio among old people and working people. And that's the an issue, because who's gonna take care? What the welfare will do? So who is afraid of the fact that we're gonna lose jobs? It does not consider that jobs will diminish because workers will be less and less. So that's a completely different vision, but I will, I will comment this at the very end. So clearly, there's no way to give an intelligence to a machine with a resident computer because the computer is too weak, it's too little performing. So for the future, let's say next 10 years, for sure, there will be a machine like a, a super mobile phone capable to actuate movement, connected to a very fast wireless protocol like 5G, 6G. We need to go into the 300 uh, megabyte per second, otherwise it's too slow. When you say to the robot, give me that bottle, it should not take two seconds to understand the, the indication. Pointing an object and recognizing the object for a robot is a very difficult thing. And this should take less than 0.1 seconds in humans. It should take the same in, in humanoids. And then, of course, you need a cloud that will be the global repository of all the experience and the intelligence of all these machines so that you buy your robot like you buy your telephone. You bring the robot in the house. The robot will explore the house. will see all the constants, limits, landscape. And then you will say, OK, bring me the newspaper or cook one egg. And the robot will have approximately 0.3 seconds to connect to the cloud, get the recipe to cook the egg, and make it. OK, you are laughing now. But if 20 years ago somebody would have told you, in 15 years you will see your email, your TV, your Twitter, Facebook, on your phone, you would have been laughing. You would have been laughing for sure. So that's the same story. You will see. Now, it's not, not by chance that Google purchased all the robotics in the world. It's not by chance that now the, the giants of the ICT are fighting for the control of the cloud. I mean, this is something really beyond our heads at the moment. So let me, let me show you now how this is being implemented. In order biomechanics to be effective, you need senses to be synergistic. We are machines integrating tactile inputs, uh, visual inputs, and acoustic inputs, at least. And from this, we have a perception reality, and we act consequently. So at least we need to reproduce the senses of the human body to integrate this in a machine and to give a code for the use of these inputs in a way that then you can decide what the machine can decide what to do next. So the first thing is, is the skin. Tactile capability <clears throat> is one of the most important things for, for, for a social uh, machine. This machine now is completely covered by tactile skin. And this is a vectorial machine. So not only can feel the touch, but can also understand whether you're pushing or pulling and after this, it decides whether they want to hold you or keep far from you. First social impact is tactile impact. And once you have a tactile capability, you are no longer an XYZ machine. So I don't give you the coordinates. I just show you the trajectory. 
And if you wor work with trajectory, you become a dynamical machine. You're no longer a cinematic machine. This is exactly the example I'm telling you. Once I show you <clears throat> how to fill the cup with the serials, you don't learn uh, this movement because like in the automatic in, uh, in the automation in the industry, this cup is in X, Y, Z position. You just learn a trajectory. And if I move the target, you change the trajectory because you have learned the dynamic of the process. You didn't learn the final and initial position. This is why we said that if, if a robot is force controlled and torque controlled, it's a safe machine. What happens in the industry? You have a big cage, there's a robot doing this. Trillions times a day. And if by chance a human passes through, it will kill the human. This happened very recently. This is position controlled, X, Y, Z. This machine would never kill a human. Because it's like us. If I do like this, I feel, oops, there's an object here. So I feel something. I understand that by vector, I cannot go further. I, I have to go back. And so I'm a safe human. And the machine to be safe needs exactly the same capability. And then you need the intelligence to, of course, to interpret this sensorial input consequently. <clears throat> the robotic skin is a capacitive machine. Okay, I'm a physicist. I have to go back to some physics sometimes. This is a capacitive, a capacitive sensor. So it's a soft uh, electronics, completely soft, can bound and wrap completely all parts of the body. It is temperature drift uh, corrected. Well, for physicists, this is a, a tricky thing because capacity changes a little bit by temperature, and this is correct. It's a very sophisticated electronics. It has a resolution of few microns in position, like the human skin. <clears throat> and there is an intelligence that correlates the vestibular system, which is 3D acceleration, 3D rate of turn, with very high angular resolution. So this is the vestibular system we have in the ears, basically, this equivalent, uh, the input from the ears. And then we have special motors that introduce, that incorporate torque control, force control, position control. So the feedback given by the, by the tactile capability controls directly the motors, so the actuators, like the muscles, and these are interconnected uh, with the vestibular system to keep the equilibrium in the position. It means, uh, to give you an idea, approximately 2,000, 2000 sensors integrated in a, in a unified control system. The intelligence in this case is a biomechanical intelligence, meaning, means uh, taking measurements from the inertial, like gravity uh, parameters, position, velocity, acceleration, force, torques, torques, compute the external forces by combining location from skin and intensity from the force torque sensors, removing any internal dynamics, including inertial Coriolis and gra gravitational effect, otherwise you, you cannot go exactly where you want, and then compute movement depending on the external forces. This thing is done in a fraction of a second. And this starts to be a very big challenge in terms of uh, uh, control, uh, electronic integration, nanotechnology materials, brain imitation. <coughs> okay, that's a paradigmatic idea. The gaze stabilization, for instance, is something typical of humans. You can never do any exercise like this if you point towards the ground. You, you really need to see the horizon, otherwise you cannot keep your equilibrium. So the robot really behaves like a human here. Even better, this could be a professional dancer or a martial art expert. And you see, how, how impressive is the dynamical equilibrium here? Because the robot re reacts real time to external perturbation. Try to do this with a human, or with any other machine that you are aware of. <clears throat> okay, of course, we, we can learn more lessons from nature. You know, I've ever seen a swarm motion, like the, these little fishes in the water. The first fish moves and all the other, they go fastly and simultaneously together. I mean, how do they do this? Or the same is for birds in a, in a storm. Uh, actually, fishes have hair cells. Very sensitive cells that upon vibration due to um, viscoelastic perturbation or turbulence, they produce electric signals. So these are like piezoelectric materials. Now, we're reproducing piezoelectric plastics by using special polymers. We create devices. <coughs> these are kind of soft nanotechnologies. Devices are like cilia. This is approximately 400 microns by 100 uh, with, with, with a totally flexible technology, including the conductive part. And upon vibration, these things that produce energy, they produce current. And this current can be used either to power a system or 
to sense a change of turbulence, so to direct the movement, so to make skin, basically, new skin. This gives you an idea how, how sensitive this, this thing can be. This boy is blowing 1.2 meter per second, like, like this. You see this uh, little plastic foil, and you see here the current generated is approximately 10 milliwatts. It's a huge amount of power. Tra just transforming air turbulence into electric power. Of course, you have two possibilities for that. You can make the most sensitive skin ever seen, artificial skin ever seen in the planet, very expensive, or you can cover your jacket with this thing, or the uh, underneath a boat, and exploiting the turbulence of the viscoelastic medium around to generate current, to power your GPS, to power your telephone while you pedal the bicycle and so on. So this is how, uh, without even having a plan for that, you produce a technology that goes directly into energy production. This is called energy harvesting. It's quite a field now, it's growing a lot, and there is a very big potential market. We did this for, <coughs> actually for the skin, but it came out to be very sensitive. Another thing I want to tell you, the forecast is that in approximately 15 years, there will be one billion robots on the planet's surface. Approximately like the cars now. And you know, one problem with cars is that they are not biodegradable. So people are trying to recycle plastic, they do their best, but as a matter of fact, polymer plastic degradates in approximately 1,000 years. And this is actually a consequence of the uh, polymeric uh, structure. Now we can use other polymers, sugars like cellu cellulose, that can be recovered by natural sources. Now for your information, um, uh, Italy produces 26 million tons of vegetable waste every year by the food industry. And this is just waste. There are reactions that can be exploited, a little bit similar to what is being exploited for bioethanol, but you know, not exactly the same, in a way that you can recover natural cellulose from the vegetable waste. And then you can reassemble in a way that, uh, for instance, this is a parsley plastic. The parsley is produced in Alessandria. You can do with potato, you can do with any, with, with tomato, you can use any, any comp we are working with all the most important food companies around the country, and you can make plastics. Actually, the interesting thing is that if you compare in this, oops, sorry. If you compare in this plot, what you can do with this plastic, um, if you compare the ultimate tensile strength, the breaking charge, towards the young modulus, and this is the flexibility, basically, you see that you go from PDMS, which is the rubber of the kitchen globe, it's very, very soft, very elastic, up to the PET, which is the, the plastic of the bottles, very tough, well, you can cover the entire mechanical range um, by using spinach, parsley, rice, cacao, and, and different combinations. So just by recovering, just by recovering uh, cellulose from the waste of the uh, food companies, you get plastics whose biodegradation time does not exceed 24 months. They are attacked by bacteria, so they can just dissolve in nature. But in terms of mechanical properties in, in protected environment like here, they can last for years. So this is now being implemented into the external scaffold of the robots because the first thing we have to do is to, we have to make a robot which is sustainable. Don't think now, think in 20 years when this will be a problem. The average lifetime of these telephones is a couple of years and now you, you read on the newspaper that there is a problem about all the electronic waste that we, we don't know how to manage. It's full of uh, uh, toxic materials and so on and so forth. Another important issue, we want to go towards the biomimetic thing, so we need to have very flexible uh, systems. We don't want to have cables, wires, copper, these things. We need plastic, plastic in the mechanical sense, flexible circuitry. Okay, here in Pisa we launched, uh, uh, together with other guys in, uh, in Genova, a huge um, initiative about graphene. So graphene seems to be a very magic material. It, it, it cures the common cold too, but it's not true. I think that the, the real good point of graphene is that it, it's a jewelry material. It's too expensive. It's too difficult to handle. I don't think it will have a great future in itself. The real future of graphene is that you can make very small pieces, each piece being almost monatomically thin, very, very ordered hexagonal uh, carbon structure. It's soluble and processed in a way that by ultracentrifugation and ultrasonication you can make an ink. This ink can be inkjet printed. And at this point, you do very simple things that are very biomimetic. This is a piece of paper, just a piece of paper, the angle chip. There are two stripes of this ink, like to brush things. This is an LED, this is connected to the USB port of the computer. So a piece of paper is a very flexible conductor you can use to make a circuit. 
We say, okay, fine, but the, we already know other plastic circuits. But you cannot treat a plastic circuit like this. Because this, I th to my opinion, is the real key point of a hybrid composite that is based on graphene inks and graphene nanocomposites. So this is 100% biocompatible, almost unbreakable. I think you, you would never dare to do anything like this on a, on a circuit, I'm sure. Uh, this is a piece of paper. Now imagine that you can print, you can design all your circuitry in the robot directly into the elastic scaffold. No wires, no connection. You just print all the circuitry. You see, it still work. Oh, by the way, you can get uh, electric conductivities at uh, percentage of this composite in the range of a few percent in weight that are very, very, very close to the metallic conductivity. You see here how, how the sheet resistance drops. In the meantime, you, you have an increase in the young modulus that, that gives you an idea that meanwhile you make the material conductive, you make the material more robust, which seems to be a very interesting property because we are talking about the biodegradable and extremely um, handable material. So I'm going towards the end. Um, five minutes, seven minutes. <clears throat> uh, what next? There's an artificial intelligence shopping list. We want these machines to learn by action, to be adaptive, to imitate. Because at this point, we need to coordinate vision, sensory motor coordination, and speech in a way that the, the, the robot, the humanoid, becomes really social. So it can interact with you. There are many things uh, that I'm not going to show. Uh, learning by action is one of the issues. This, this implies a lot of big data analysis, machine learning. It's not easy for a machine to select in the landscape of millions of uh, information which are those relevant to the next action. So here we, we merge machine learning, big data, and of course uh, uh, neuroscience in a way that uh, should be developed synergistically. We are at the very beginning in this field, but actually, I mean, in, in, this, in this movie, uh, there is a simultaneous representation of, of three learning by action uh, examples in which the, the robot has to essentially approach an object which is out of reach by using a tool. Essentially, the object is too far, and you, you want to approach this object, making the object closer by using the tool. And there are different strategies that combine, uh, of course, vision, tactile capabilities, and so on. And in the end, one is good, the other are not. So the robot learns by action. And of course, this, this lesson should be stored in a global repository of, a repository of intelligence. It will never be resident forever, like in our brain. So this is a limitation. But anyway, the, the, the robot trains in many circumstances. Here, for instance, there is a, a convolution neural network um, approach for recognizing objects. The robot is constantly trained for recognizing real objects. So uh, this, this is a very interesting um, experiment. This, this again, once again, is vision and machine learning together. So you see, uh, imagine you have 25 objects to recognize all these things, the, the brush, the bottle, the plate, and so on, common objects. The larger the number of objects, of, of objects, of objects the more the robot should stay, keep atten the attention to recognize them. Of course, you want a fast machine like us. When we see an object, we take a fraction of a second and we know what is this. The robot for only 25 objects needs, uh, in blue, essentially, let's see, in, in red, five seconds for 25 objects to have, a, to have a, a mistake rate of approximately 10%. So imagine, we, we recognize millions of objects simultaneously. The robot for 25 objects, with a repertory of 25 ob objects, requires at least attention for five seconds to make sure uh, having a good recognition. So this, this prevents the robot right now to be in real environment. So this requires a very advanced simulation of the process of vision and recognition. So it's, this is a lot of mathematics. There's a lot of, again, machine learning. And then this has to be transferred into control codes. Um, this is the typical situation in which you teach the robot to recognize many objects. This is how the robot has learned to, to write. Uh, ICAP can write now. He has learned the alphabet, he has learned writing. <clears throat> now, when you test the system, essentially you put all the, all the objects on the table and you say, can you recognize the octopus? Can you recognize the fish? And then the robot needs a few seconds to find the right object, which is already an outstanding result because this is a real confrontation. It's a real world, it's not, it's not a, a simulation actually. 
obviously there is a 3D awareness, because it's not only to see the object and recognize, but also to, to have a telemetric vision of the object. So the robot has to have a, a real and a virtual reality uh, description of, of what, what it's observing. And this is very important because then grasping is connected to the representation of the, of the 3D reality. So when we see an object, we have a 3D representation, and roughly we know that by elongating the hand, we can touch it or grasp it. So for, for the robot, it's exactly the same. Sometimes the robot is completely uh, un, 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 uncalibrated, so it, it needs a, a, a sort of telemetric calibration of reality like this. It has to, it has to span all the horizon like this to, to have a telemetric representation. These things actually are not uh, simple programs that you do with the joystick of the PlayStation, you, you operate by remote. This is just the intelligence of the machine. Uh, they require a tremendous effort in terms of uh, development. And the first thing is to, to have neuromorphic cameras. There's a lot of technology here. So uh, neuromorphic cameras are cameras having uh, at the center, typically, let's say somewhere here, just a small bunch of pixels. We're talking about uh, uh, not more than 10,000 pixels, OK? Normally, cameras are megapixel, millions of pixels. But you need a neuromorphic camera. At the center, you want something which is dynamic, is differential. So we don't care about observing reality and accumulating images. At this moment, I'm watching you, OK? 95% uh, of what I see is not changing in time. So I see it once, and I keep it in my memory. And I only see what is changing. For me, it's, it's obviously automatic. For the machine, it's impossible with, the, with nowadays technology, unless you have a neuromorphic camera in which the central part of the camera only perceives time var variation in the image. And the rest is just a stable part. So you save memory. This essentially allows the machine, allows the robot, to see dynamically things. This is a, a, a real image. So it's, it's a, a, a cube, rubric, cube, yeah, changing. And this allows the machine to have the gaze in real time, almost real time, like humans. Essentially, you see, it's almost synchronized, not as, as fast as we would like, but the gaze is, is synchronized to the real motion of the objects. No machine can do this with normal cameras. And this is very important because uh, then the, the robot needs to interact with, with humans. This is the Simon game. Actually, this got uh, uh, the Microsoft Kinect uh, Award, uh, second, uh, recently in Providence. Uh, so the robot is playing with, with, uh, with one of the trainer. This is one of the robot trainer. She's a girl uh, spending a postdoc in our place. So they are playing. Essentially, this is the Simon game where you do uh, a movement. The other has to copy and has to, to add another one. And then you have to reproduce the sequence till you, you make a mistake. Of course, the robot always wins. Normally, he wins at the eighth or ninth movement. It's very long. But it's fantastic, because he can really now recognize real time the movement, reproduce it, and generate a new one. And in the end, the girl will fail. The robot will never fail in this. So, ultimately, OK, what I'm showing you here is one of the first experiments of social behavior. I mean, now the machine is doing everything it can do autonomously. Two guys are talking, calling the attention. The machine is, OK, it's a bit slow, like a small kid. And, and it's trying to adapt. So there is a focus in the attention. Uh, there is, of course, a synchronization of speech recognition, uh, social behavior, basically, vision and sound together. And uh, the silencing map is designed in real time, so the robot tries to follow all the inputs coming from the surrounding reality. Well, I conclude just showing you something that, uh, to my opinion, is, uh, I mean, it goes, back, uh, goes back to real life. What I've shown you before will possibly be something useful in the future and possibly be something in all our houses in, let's say, 10 years, at the cost of a scooter. Um, on March, we will deliver the first plastic robot. This will be a machine for approximately 12,000 euro, market price. It will be capable to operate in the house and to assist people. This will be the first robot like this, the tall. Um, so we are really moving towards uh, something for the house, not, not for only for science fiction. But there is something more important. Now, how can we use this thing? So I want to show you one of the first deliverables, which is to help people having serious problem, problems. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, a very unique hand. 
It's 100% plastic, addictive manufacturing, so 3D printing. And as you can see, there's only one motor. This one motor reproduces 85% of the human movements in terms of grasping and hand manipula manipulation. So we, it is now being tested on approximately 100 patients in several hospitals from the Mayo Clinics in the United States to the, to the Budrio Center in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Inail, in Budrio. This is actually, these are uh, some of our patients. So what we do, we essentially, we realize the passive prosthesis. The passive prosthesis is very standard, okay, what everybody has. But in the passive prosthesis, there are myoelectric contacts that are being developed by our people, and they register the surface uh, electric fields due to essentially the muscle and tendons um, uh, tension. And this is one of the users, after three weeks of training with this hand, actually all the electronics is here. You see, th this guy was amputated, amputated 35 years ago at the age of 15. He was uh, an handcraft. Um, he has tried all the prosthetic system in, in, on the market. Uh, normally, this prosthetic system are very complex, costing in the range of 50,000 euro, and, and essentially very difficult to, to operate. Actually, this one is essentially like a glow. You can remove this anytime. Uh, you have only a Velcro strap here for the electronics. Um, the cost of, of a prosthetic system like this is in the range of 7,000 euro. So it's, it, 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 it's a total drop compared to the market. And now this will be, as you can see here, will be used for very intensive use, like uh, uh, starting again to work in the, in, in the lab. Uh, this, this is possibly unbelievable when you see it. I mean, it's really... So now there's a second prototype, the hand, which, which has also the bent uh, finger, in a way that you can take the credit card or the bancomat, which is what all the amputees required. So not only to have the grasping like this, but also having this movement, which is functional to take a credit card or to insert things in a very thin uh, uh, place. So this is going to be the, uh, the next release. And uh, by next year, this will be, will be on the market. OK, so empathy, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, clearly, empathy is something unidirectional. When we see TV, TV does not see us. Uh, the, same will be with, the same will be with robots. So very likely, the design of this robot uh, played a very important role in becoming the most diffuse robot in the world because it's handsome, it's beautiful, it's cute, but it's a machine. And these are my thanks to all the people in the iCap team, in the smart materials, in the graphene team, in the retina team that I didn't show, in the MEM, in the MEMS team, and so on. So this, this is obviously an ensemble of many people working. Every PI here has a big group behind, so it's more than 400 people working on those platforms. Uh, and you're welcome if you want to visit the lab to, to see these things real, in, in, in real uh, environment, real time. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been amazing. And I think that there will be many comments, questions. I'm not going to ask you something about plastic because it was too long discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm but, sure. Uh, it's not detailed. <laughs> uh, just two to, to small, two minor questions. One purely technical, and I, it was not clear to me what kind of material uh, you propose for obtaining a, a conductivity similar to metal. It is a, a homogeneous distributed conducting, like nanocomposite, or you have a, a heterogeneous. This, yeah. this. That's, a, that's a, a polymeric matrix uh, which uh, embeds some 1% to 5% in weight uh, nanoflakes of graphene. And the mechanism of conductivity is hopping among the islands. So there's a critical uh, interflake distance sure. for which you optimize the conductivity, but also roughly at the same range you optimize the mechanical properties, which is a property of the matrix, by the way. So if you operate properly in the matrix choice and in the flake dimension. Matrix was completely isolating? The, ma the matrix is not conductive. It's a hopping mechanism. But that's much higher than, than the normal values. Sure, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievably high. Yes. 
Exactly. By the way, this is like PLE, or it could be matter B polymers, okay. or it could be things that you can hot press. Insulating product. Absolutely, yes. Second question is out, completely out of my knowledge. Uh, in the past, I had the opportunity to participate in a European project on uh, uh, artificial brains. Uh, there was a uh, conduct, uh, guided, coordinated by Professor Marco Fontana. Is that oh, yeah, I remember Europe? Marco, yes, yes, yeah. Good opportunity to remember him. Yeah, yeah. And at that time, we were working about the learning by favoring a signal passing always in the same direction. So in that sense, I was wondering, if you, uh, when you repeat an experiment with one robot, repetition makes some changes? Or to, is the robot learning something by repeating the it, same thing? In most cases, our artificial intelligence procedures are kind of trial and error uh, procedures so that you... Um, of course, you, you increase precision or accuracy, but the, the relative accuracy uh, from measure to measure decreases, so it saturates yeah, towards yeah. the best movement. However, when you switch off the, the, the robot, you forget everything. That's why you need, that's why you need the, the cloud. Uh, and no memory. Exactly. If you want to have a, a, an always-on robot that is a standby machine, you can do this. But you easily saturate the memory because the memory is one of the most expensive in terms of power, yeah. power the most expensive system. So you, you forget having a big memory, 24, 24 operating in a machine. That will cost in energy much more than all, than all the rest. So you better have a cloud with big problems in uh, privacy. And not, of course, we are aware. We have to take care of our memory. Absolutely. Parkinson is something that will touch also machines. Yeah. <laughs> What about miniaturization of, uh, of robots in the IIT? Uh, yeah, I think that um, when they're very small, we, we, I, I like to call them biochemical robots, as I said in the beginning. So I think they have, they have to be in the macromolecule size, or, or let's say 100 nanometers, more than a macromolecule, but they, they cannot be bigger than that. Otherwise, they become just intruders into the, into the body, and they are attacked by, by the immunitary system and so on and so forth. Uh, as long as you go on a bigger systems, they become, anyway, micromechanics, micromechanical systems. So biomechanics play, play a role, De definitely. I mean, I, I think that the real, the real boundary is when biomechanics starts playing a role. Below a certain dimension, it's only microfluidics, fluidodynamics, biochemical interactions, and there you play with different rules. If you have anything biomechanical, then you need a power source. If you need a power source, um, I cannot say this in an in a elegant way, but of course, you, let's say you are in trouble, okay? Because you need, <laughs> you need something heavy, something rechargeable, toxic, and that's another story. Very simple question. How powerful is the artificial hand that you were showing at the last oh, slide? Oh, yes, thank you. I mean, I have to say, uh, I was asked to, to, to give some kind of dissemination-like information, so it was not very precise in certain respects, including plastics and polymers. So it was a somewhat more uh, shallow, the, the presentation. So, um, numbers about the hand. Uh, this prototype that you have seen is a, machine, is a, is a hand with nine watts of power, which is enough to grasp one, one liter bottle. Uh, the new pro this was developed together with our friends in, uh, in Centro Piaggio in Pisa. This is the, the first prototype. Now, the new, uh, the new prototype, which is uh, more advanced, having this uh, toe that I told you before, uh, it can run 30,000 cycles, which means years, no? um, with, uh, with the grasping power up to three kilos. That starts to be quite, quite a good thing, like, like shaking the hand to somebody. If you do it with three kilos, the guy will say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, so it, it's a serious grasp. Any other? Well, that, on the other hand, you saw the guy with the drill. So for this, you need approximately one and a half kilo. Of course, the other hand was pushing, but with the prosthetic, you, you were keeping and, and running the, the switch. So it was quite okay. Are there any? Uh, uh -huh. Okay, if not, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>